begin with <coughs> 10,000. Seated and Ian, would you proceed with the reading? <coughs> Thinking about the reading we're going to have in a moment, still from the book of Revelation, I was thinking about you children and I was thinking about times when you perhaps had a mask. Have you been to a 
birthday party and had a mask to pretend you're somebody else. Eh? We call that a disguise. Can you say disguise? Disguise. disguise. We, we, we try to be somebody uh, so that they even don't recognize us. Now, what I want to show you and remind you about is that how long ago is it? It's, I think it's two months since, or maybe only last month, we had the story of the, was it last month? You've been, that was in June, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, but um, we've been having this as one of the focus for uh, our services of worship. This is the seven-headed dragon. And we had uh, the story of him coming, uh, coming to grief because Michael uh, fought against the dragon and he was cast down to the earth. When he was cast down to the earth, he tried to pretend he was somebody else. And that's what this chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, is all about. So think of the dragon, but also think of times when you've tried to pretend you're somebody else. Listen carefully. He tries two things, and then perhaps at the end I'll ask you, what did he try to pass himself off? How did he try to pretend to be somebody else? This is from the word of the Lord from the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Forty and two months. Do you know how long that is? Forty-two months. Think about that. Over three years, how many would three years be? Three, and three years and five. No, no, three months. months. How many months in a year? Well, so three, 36. 36. And, and then 42? 42? Six months. Six months. Okay, so there was given power unto him to continue... Forty and two months, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have any ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Okay, that's number one. Remember I told you about him trying to pretend to be something else? Now listen to this one. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a, like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So be careful. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand. It's your right hand. <coughs> Which is your right hand? So, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads, or on their foreheads. 
and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that under, hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six hundred, three score, and six. What's that? Six, 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 yeah, six, six, six. That's the reading, friends, from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, the dragon, and he tried two things to deceive, pretending to be what he hoped would fool everybody else. So there he is there, the seven-headed dragon, trying to deceive the world. So happy Father's Day if you're a father, and, or it's spring, if you want to focus on spring, it's, it's getting warmer. I'm just getting the boys to bring the offering. <clears throat> There's such rich text we're going to be working from today, and it really is very exciting what comes up out of this text, and it's not what we think it is. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, you give us this day as a gift, and we ask that it will be filled with praise and gratitude as we think upon you. It'll be rich with relationship, that we'll appreciate each other and our friends and what we have and all that you've given us. And that we may live in a way today that honours you. Amen. <coughs> Friends, as we prepare our heart for Holy Supper, let's, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So we're going to talk to you little people in a moment, but before we do, we're going to read, prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper. You turn to the back of the order of service, we have a reading there prepared for us. And in the very book of Revelation, we also read the words, Blessed are they who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. <coughs> reading from Heaven and Hell 283. For this reason, all who are in hell are wholly antagonistic to innocence. They do not know what innocence is. So antagonistic are they that so far as anyone is innocent, they burn to do him harm or mischief. Therefore, they, commit, they cannot bear to see little children. As soon as they see them, they are inflamed with a cruel desire, desire to do them harm. From this, it is clear that man's ego, or proprium, and therefore love of self, is antagonistic to innocence, for all who are in hell are in their ego, and therefore are in the love of self. Reading from Matthew 15, 1 to 20, and then, came Jesus, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do these disciples transgress the tra tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? For God commands, saying, Honour your father and mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whatsoever shall uh, you say, Ah, oh, whosoever, thank you. Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, It is a gift by whatsoever you may have profited by me, and <coughs> honour not his father and mother, shall be free. And they did this by saying, 
come and offer us offerings at the temple or work for us at the temple and you'll be freed of your obligation to your mum and dad. Because people have an obligation, particularly in those cultures, to look after mum and dad in their latter years. And so the Pharisees were presenting this idea of do this here and that will satisfy what actually was a commandment from God. Now reading on. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well has Isaiah prophesied of you saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honours me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and he said to them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are the blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they shall both fall into a ditch. Then answered Peter and said to him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are you still so yet without understanding? Do not yet... Uh, do not ye know yet understand that whatsoever enters into the mouth goes into the belly and comes out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft and false witness and blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. So today as we prepare to take Holy Supper, I want you to understand that eating some bread or even drinking some wine is not really what makes one holy. But it's our heart. As we approach the Holy Supper, when we approach it and we say, Lord, this bread represents your goodness that will nourish my life. And I take of it saying, Lord, nourish my life. And Lord, this wine represents your truths. Let it fill my heart with understanding and wisdom. So I encourage you today as you approach Holy Supper, let your heart be open to the Lord to eat with him like a child eating with their father. Ian, would you? night of that final supper the Lord took the bread and he blessed it and then he broke it and he said this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me
is written, be still and know that I am God. took the cup and after he made a blessing he turned to his disciples he said this drink is for you it is my blood of the covenant and it has been poured out for forgiveness of sin Jesus said, whoever walks in my light will not know darkness, but they will know the love of the Father. <coughs> so I think I have all the little ones at the front here. Oh, that's good. Can I get room for my chair there? his story of one thing that Jesus did from the book of Luke chapter 13 Jesus spent a lot of time doing what? What's up, what would helping, people. helping people yes that's really good he would often speak to people in large crowds but where was he when he was speaking to these people in large crowds? Yes, off in some populated area, wasn't he? A beach. A beach, yes. Yep. That's fishing? well done. Maybe fishing, that's true. You often pulled, there were they times when they were fishing and they, you talked to them. They did fishing, also. not Yes. And most of the time it was relatively peaceful, a beautiful event. But this time Jesus here is, <coughs> is speaking in the temple and he's about to find 
conflict. Let's read. Luke 13. Conflict. Conflict, yes. He's about to be challenged. And so am I. The pages are sticking together. There we go. Verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues or temples on the Sabbath. And lo, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And she was, bend- she was bending together and utterly unable to stand. Now perceiving her, Jesus spoke aloud to her and said, Woman, you have been released from your infirmity. And then he placed his hands on her, and instantly she was made erect, and she glorified God. So, seeing you're here, I want you to bend over for me. Bend over, bend right over, almost like you're touching your toes. Pretend you're touching your toes. That's it, bend over. Now, this is very much what this woman was like. Her, her back was so bent over that she couldn't even lift her head up to see the Lord who was reaching out to touch her. Sit, sit down, little man. Sit down. Then her back straightened up and she could look up at the one who healed her. goes on to say, here comes the conflict bit. All right. It says... Well, actually, one other thing happens first. He placed his hands on her, and instantly she was made straight. And they glorified God. Imagine the noise. Imagine seeing this, being in a crowd, a woman who's been bent over, 18 years bent over, and suddenly back straightens up, and she can see God. She can see, see, look up and see Jesus. It would have been painful, but all the crowds would have just cheered at seeing something like that. He says here. Now, answering the chief of the synagogues, resenting that Jesus had cured a person on the Sabbath, said to the people, Six days there are in which one can work, and on them come and be cured, but do not come on the Sabbath day. Hmm, interesting. Yet the Lord answered and said, Hypocrite! It's the second time we've heard that word this morning, isn't it? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Each of you on the Sabbath, if he uh, is he not loosing his ox from the manger and leading him away to give him a drink? Now this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound these 18 years. Notice the Lord even knew how long she'd been bound. She didn't say how long she'd been bound. He just knew. He just knew these things. This woman had been bound by Satan... 18 years, must she not be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And at this saying, all those opposed him were mortified. But the entire throng of people all began to glorify God at the thing that he had done. So, in this story, you've got people who are supposed to be godly, they're leading, they're leaders of the church, they got upset at this woman getting healed. Isn't that interesting? I mean, they were upset, they they got upset because you broke the Sabbath. Do we know what the Sabbath is? The seventh day. The seventh day, yeah. It's a day we worship God and go to church. It's a day we worship God, go to church. And what else were were the people back then supposed to do on the Sabbath? Um, Or not do? They weren't, not fishing, they're not allowed to fish. They're not allowed to work, were they? They were told, don't go to work on this day. So to, to, try, and, to try and attack Jesus, to try and attack Jesus, they tried to accuse him. has the power. Yes, he has the power. They tried to accuse him of working. And all he was really doing was setting a woman free who'd been hurt all this time. Isn't it? Jesus is often wanting to do good things for us. And sometimes we don't quite understand. <coughs> maybe we, our, our rules and our regulations, maybe our idea of what's right and wrong is getting offended. But here this woman, 
she able to glorify God after 18 years? Wouldn't you, after being hurt and bent over like that all that time, wouldn't you be so happy that God did something like that for you? No. Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't be able to spot the power with that. People. Yes. Matthew said he probably wouldn't survive an hour being like that. An hour. And here she was, 18 years. Do you think she was worried about what day of the week it was? No. no. Neither is God. Not in that sense. The Sabbath is a day that we do good. We do good to each other. Yes. yes, that's true. How about we bow our heads? you want to pray with me? Okay. You pray with me, little man? Ready? Just say, Lord... Sometimes we can't see you, Lord. Sometimes life has pushed us over. Sometimes Satan has pushed us over. All we can see is the ground. And maybe the devil. Help us, Lord. Heal us. Lift our eyes. Straighten our back. To keep our eyes on you. For you are love itself. Amen. Thank you, little one. You've been very patient. This is the time where you're allowed to, to, to go. I think Bev has a, something prepared. Yep, off the children's church. quite amazing, isn't it, to think of how we, we, we bend ourselves out of shape sometimes? And the tragedy is that they're doing this in the name of God, weren't they? You know, these leaders were attacking God himself in flesh for doing good. What was really going on there, do you think? What, what was really a threat? Why were they so threatened by Jesus? Because that's part of the message today. Think about what is the ego? Particularly in this case, the false ego. The false ego today. We're going to talk about that. These men were really threatened. Their power had been threatened by what Jesus was doing. Now, why weren't they doing those kind of healings? Yes, the conscience. Well said. Yes. So today I've got seven key lessons I want to bring out of this chapter. Such rich text and Boy, like every other chapter of the Apocalypse, it's so easy for us to get dragged away into the sensual, isn't it? To get dragged away by the imagery of these beasts and the enslavement of the world and the mark and all that's going on. And I really understand why people think that way. I myself read these texts many years ago and wondered, is that what it's talking about? But here are seven things I just want to bring out for you today, just quickly. That the, the false ego from this, this chapter here we first discovered it in chapter 12 in the form of the dragon. And now it's moved forward into this chapter and it's taken a new form. Two, this, this dragon ego has been cast down to earth. It's no longer in the heavens, it's in earth. Three, this chapter really highlights the need for us to become a soul warrior. Being a spiritual follower is not passive. It's not all peace and love and joy. There is a, a fight that we're called to. For there are two very unique ways the dragon's manifesting in this chapter. And we'll touch on this briefly. Five, it brings out cycles of evil. And war on the saints. Cycles of evil that we have to go through. Six, our need for patience in all of this. If we want to get out of what this chapter actually refers to as, in the spiritual sense, endless cycles of spiritual battle. And that's the seventh point. The mark of the beast itself, 666, is exactly that. Endless battles. Who wants endless battles? Not a hand goes up. I put mine down. No, no, we don't want endless battles. But, you know, as history says, sometimes to have peace, we have to have a war. But we don't want endless battles. And that's what's brought up in this chapter for us. So let's move right into it. The question, what is this false ego? We saw in chapter 12 the dragon fighting against the woman and Michael and we learnt some very important points from that and that is that God protects us very much. He's always protecting us and yet 
there's a need for us to learn to fight like Michael, isn't it? The little woman withdrawn to the wilderness and also Michael coming to her aid. What is this tyrant ego, this dragon? It's inside each one of us. And if we don't keep it in check, it will take over. And I wouldn't think there's one of us here that would ever have our ego fully take over in that way. But only two days ago, tragically, only two days ago, and it was caught on CCTV, a woman in about, she was in her 40s, chalk Asian woman in America. She's liberal, left. She's an artist, but she was failing. She had no work. And in her, this hatred had brewed towards just the average American family, attractive um, American family. She just had this hatred brewing. She took a butcher's knife and she wandered the streets till she just was walking past this couple, a mum carrying her daughter, uh, walking with the daughter and, and a father walking with a slightly older daughter. And she just walked up and then turned and thrust the knife into this little child's face twice. And then just tried to walk off. And the father turned around, so she turned around and tried to get the, do- the other daughter in the father's hands. He pulls her away and then he tries to get her and she tries to get him. And then she disappears through a a, a sea of traffic and the police arrest her later. It was all caught on camera. And you think, why? Why would someone want to hurt a little child? Isn't it? Isn't it? I can't fathom that. I can't. But like our reading in... in, And I'm sorry about the readings being a little longer in Holy Supper, but I really wanted us to, to bring in this idea of innocence. We come to the Lord like children to his table. And here, if you look on the back of the order of service, it really just brought home that when we're in our ego, in its full fury, it hates what's innocent. Innocence wants to be led by God. All of heaven wants God to take over and to lead them. But here, the ego can't stand having someone lead it. I will lead myself, thank you. And this bruise and bruise and bruise to the point that it even hates children. Children? Because children are the embodiment of innocence, aren't they? Okay, so this tyrant ego, could, could it really be inside each one of us? What about Jim Jones? Do we all know the story of Jim Jones? Jonestown? Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You ever heard that, you know, heard that saying? Oh, well, won't you just go and drink the Kool-Aid? Do you know that one, Guan? Jim Jones. 1955, he'd been in ministry a while, but his church was really starting to grow. He was a minister, and he loved helping feed people in the streets. He was Pentecostal, I'm not holding that against him, but in this case, he started having some apparent healings, and his church really grew. It's about nine years later, I think, 1964, a real fear of nuclear war came up in this man. You'll find this often happens in a lot of these egocentric outbursts where there's a fear, apocalyptic fear. Fear of nuclear war, he ends up moving his church to North Carolina, uh, no, North California, sorry. And then he he calls himself the prophet. The prophet. He starts, continues to grow, and then a fear in him of the government rises up. So he moves them one more time down to South America, to a a commune, uh, agricultural commune and they start producing food and growing and they grow into quite a large group and over a number of years abuses begin to happen money's held onto millions of dollars are held onto people's passports are held onto start this this desire to control i think it was 1967 in come in came a congressman from america with some relatives who were very concerned family members and some investigations, and over four days they they did an investigation into this man. And after four days he broke. Jim Jones broke. The ego just took over completely. Prior to this, he'd had his people doing strange things, like even practicing mass suicide, and said, this will be your only salvation when the governments of this world come down upon us. So he broke. He turned to his people and he said, take them out now, and they got guns and they shot these people. And then in a panic, he then did the unthinkable thing. The tyrant came out and he got everyone there to actually go through this ritual again of suicide. As this time he'd laced the Kool-Aid, literally, with cyanide. And 19, 913 people died. 276 children. 
There was a few people that escaped, that saw the writing on the wall and said, this is wrong, and escaped. But that took days for them to get out of the jungle, because they were deep in the jungle. So there's one example of the ego. Starting, you know, it was a man that really was trying to do something good, but the ego took over. What about Charles Manson? Hmm? That was the end of the wonderful 60s in America. Shocked them. He had a little, little commune as well. And he took in these teenagers who were disgruntled. And he just got madder and madder and madder, his ego. And he had them so convinced that he was some kind of messiah that he sent them out on three murdering rampages, just random murdering rampages. Well, it doesn't stop there. What about, you know, I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone particularly, but China under Mao, 60 million people. Soviet Russia under Stalin, 40 million. Germany under Hitler, something like 20 million. That's an example of what the ego does when it's... And we all have this potential, people. It's just that as spiritual people, we're, we're aware of it. Okay. So, it was Paul, actually, who said to me last month, he said, Darren, chapter 12... It was a beautiful question, Paul. Thank you for bringing it up. He said... Chapter 12 ends with the dragon now going after the remnant of the woman. He said, does this mean that this is kind of endless? Is there any end to this struggle and this battle? It was a really good question. And I said, thankfully we get to go on to chapter 12, uh, 13. And now have a look at the very first verse with me. Just open up your order service and have a look at this. And I stood upon the sands of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of uh, rise up out of the sea. The John class has shifted. Here was the John class in chapter 12 seeing a heavenly vision. Dragon fighting woman. Michael coming to the aid. Michael wins. The dragon is cast down. But the dragon is cast down to where? Do you remember? Do you remember where it's cast down to? Not the abyss. Not yet. I love your enthusiasm, Gay. We get there later on in the book. He gets to get locked up for good. He gets cast down to the earth. Right? That's our natural mind. So here we are on our journey with God and we're starting to get spiritual things in order. The ego is cast down. But the Lord says it's not enough. We now need to explore what the ego is doing in our natural mind. That's what chapter 13 is all about. So where does John find himself? On the sands, the shifting sands of the sea. And where did the beast come from? These two disguises that, that the ego takes? One's from the water, which represents the restless masses, and one's from the earth, which represents spiritual leadership. But just, just to break it down for you, I think I have... a picture of this beast. <clears throat> so he's standing in between these two dimensions on an earthly realm, seeing what the dragon can do inside us, isn't it? In a historical sense, spiritual historical sense, the, the restless masses and this beast that comes out of it represent every social political movement throughout history that fights against the Lord. And actually does it, that's what the bare feet is all about, actually does it from the word of God too. But what we're trying to do here, or what we are doing here, is we're learning to take it away from the historical and see what it means in here. That's where it's most helpful. What is it? What is this beast inside me? Okay. How does my ego manifest in this way? And I don't want to unpack all the symbolism, but I'm just quickly touching on you know, the body of a leopard. There is a very powerful beast that preys on what is innocent and harmless. Sheep and cattle and other sorts of... Think about that. Right? And of course, the lion... Uh, sorry... The devil goes around like a lion, roaring, seeing what he may devour. There's this idea of, of the seven heads being able to you know, speak with great power and authority. You know, when a lion roars, we all feel it. But I've got another picture here for you, which that's probably more accurate, but I like this one. Have a guess why I might like this picture. What? It's the same beast. Does it remind you of anything? I think it reminds me a little bit more of the dragon, doesn't it? I'll just go back to the dragon. Right? 
How many heads did the dragon have? Oh. Let's go back. Uh, sorry, what was that? Seven heads. This beast has seven heads. How many horns did the dragon have? Ten. Because it's attacking the commandments of God. Again, this beast has ten horns and it has seven crowns. A lot of it actually emulates the dragon, but it's got a new form. And this is what we find as we go on with our spiritual work. Okay, we, we, we catch our ego at work. We're pretty good at that. But what about right down on the natural level? This is speaking, the waters are speaking about the, the habitual, unconscious side of our life, our subconscious mind. Memories, deep memories, things that we've formed over years. And out comes this side of us that we don't like sometimes. It surfaces. And it's very egocentric, just like the dragon. Slightly different form. It attacks. It wants to dominate. It has power, or it believes it does. In this case, it's, it's dominating me, so it does have power. And it represents our habitual life. How many times in life have you been going along doing something habitually, and then suddenly you know, the Lord taps you on the shoulder and you go, oh, wow, I, I, I really didn't have a good motive for why I was doing that. Has that happened to you? I hope it, I'm not the only one. Yeah, I mean, Gay's nodding ahead, yeah. Isn't it? And this is the Lord exposing the dragon in its new form, okay, in our subconscious mind, coming up, rearing itself. And all the symbolism for the dragon applies to this. You know, seven heads, complete insanity. Now you think about people who are very narcissistic. Always got to draw the attention to themselves. Isn't it? Look at me, look at me, look at me. You tell them a story. Well, I got a better one. You know? They're boasting. There's those dra- there's those lion heads roaring. Boasting about how good I am, you know. Look at me, look at me, you know. Deep down there's a longing to be loved and accepted. They're feeling not accepted and loved. But they're letting the ego take over. Instead of finding the healing from the Lord. Let's let's flip to the next beast. Where is he? Ah, here he is. Looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. <laughs> okay. I love this picture. If its little mouth was closed, you would think, oh, what a, what a nice little lamb, until it bites. Isn't it? Does this, this imagery, in, does it ring true to any scriptures or something Jesus said? By the way, this chapter calls this lamb the false prophet. Does it ring a bell to any scriptures? Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they're ravening wolves. Isn't it? This is our ego again. What does this represent? This represents those areas of our life where we're more awake, we're more conscious, we're more aware. We're just not that aware. Okay? We're, we're choosing what's right and moral, like the Pharisees today. Why don't you pick another day to go and do a healing? You know, we're, we're clothing ourselves in a sense of what's right. But boy, can we talk like the dragon. You know, when, when you actually listen to what we're saying, listen to what those Pharisees were saying, they were accusing Jesus, Jesus of being evil because of the day he was doing the miracle on. Isn't it? And this is what our ego will do. It will find incredible justifications and rationales from Scripture. Why well, I'm right and you're all wrong. Why Charles Manson needed to send his people out. He, his belief was basically that there was a race war coming and he needed to trigger it. So they were going to do these murders and then blame it on black people. I mean, the, the insanity. You know, Jim Jones, you know, the government is the beast. They're coming for me. You know, I need to protect you and the only way out of here is to suicide. I mean, the insanity. You know? And what's so tragic about this is that it, it appears... Godly, on the surface. In the epistles it says, you know, the appearance of godliness, but it's denying the power thereof. Because the ego does not have the power to, to free us. It never will. It's not until we surrender the ego that we tap into the power that the divine has for us. That's why Jesus said, you too, take up your cross and follow me. So that's talking about putting our ego on the cross so that it dies, because if we let it run its course, you're going to have a ravishing, 
uh, beast coming out of your subconscious mind and one coming out of your more, co- more cognitive mind that you, you, know, you think is really good. But actually its motives are not. Equally, this is why Jesus said, it's not what goes in the lamb's mouth that counts. It's what comes out. You know, using the scriptures to justify having an affair. I honestly knew a man, uh, no, sorry, I knew a pastor whose friend was also a pastor who said, I'm just fulfilling the scripture to look after the widow. And what he actually meant was he'd go and visit them and they'd have relationships. Isn't that fascinating where our ego will go? Isn't it? Another pastor friend of mine, these are not new church pastors, folks. These are pastors when I was in mainstream Christian. Another pastor friend of mine was running late to a service and he had another pastor friend with him driving church car. And they're, they're running late, so he puts the foot down, doesn't he? And the traffic's thick, so he's weaving, trying to get through the traffic, and he's speeding. And you know, uh, my friend's going, you know, like, oh, clutching. And then he's, he turns and he says, isn't it good that we're not under the law? Do you know, you probably may or may not know that scripture, where Paul's saying, we are no longer under the law, but we're free in Christ. And of course, Paul's not talking about Ten Commandments. We still have an obligation to those commandments. He means we're not under Jewish rituals of sacrifice and, and other laws. But conveniently, you know, I'll speed in the name of God, get to the service on time, and I'm so, so glad we're not under the law anymore. And, and, and this pastor friend of mine turned and said, that's not what that scripture means. You should be ashamed of using that scripture in that way. And he said nothing, but he stopped speeding. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so that's the two ways that our ego is manifesting in this subconscious, habitual way where we're going with the crowd, we're going with the flow, you know, with the restless masses, we're just going with it, we don't even realise it's our ego. Or we're putting on a nice religious pretense and justifying why it's okay to uh, steal a bit of money. No, I won't go there, but I knew... If you want to keep talking about pastors, like you'll think that they're the worst people on the planet. But, um, okay, so let's have a look at this whole idea of cycles of, of, of evil. Turn with me, in the order of service there, just turn to, to verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. All. You can imagine people reading this and going, (coughs) literally, and going, so the spirit of Antichrist is just going to take over the whole world. And that's quite a fearful thought, isn't it? Particularly when you get to the point of uh, enslaving and marking everyone. But the point here is that that our ego is given the ability to make war against that which we know is right inside us and we're trying to do it and we're struggling to do it, isn't it? Making this war against it. And we go through these phases where we actually find ourselves sometimes even doing what's wrong. Having evil desires, evil thoughts and doing them. A period of going through it and it's like we wake up and we go, what am I doing? Isn't it? We've all had those periods in our spiritual war. I'm not talking terrible evil. I'm just, it, it could be just, you know not wanting to tell that person the truth because it's going to impact you or whatever. But the point is we go through phases where we're not really working on ourselves. We've fallen asleep. And then we catch ourselves and we go, man, I've been asleep. Time to wake up. This thing's been ruling over me. And this ties in very importantly with the mark, but we'll get there in a couple of in two points. The cycles, you're going through these periods and cycles. And that's why we need to, uh, point six is why we need to have patience. Look at verse 10. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. It's halfway through the verse. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. When we're going through spiritual battles, we have to have patience. Boy, do we have to have patience. And we have to trust God that these things are happening for a good reason. Why is this? Why do we find ourselves in chapter 12 where, where all we're seeing is rather devastating beasts and things and Where's the hope and where's the promise? And we're in the middle of a battle. We have to be patient. Because what the Lord's wanting to do is he wants to show us these patterns where our ego is winning in the natural. And he wants to break the cycle. 
Okay, he wants to break it. If you're caught in something and you can't get out of it, we call that what? Trapped. Enslavement. You're trapped. You're a slave to it. Isn't it? So we, we, our ego's got us enslaved in these habits and we're trying to lose exposing it, not to hurt, but to break its force. Because what it ends up doing is marking us. And that is point seven. The mark of the beast, 666, is... Think about the history of slavery. It's tragic. It's been going on since the hunter-gatherer days. People enslaving each other. You know, one tribe is threatened by the other. They take over and they, they capture them and make slaves. And in order to separate the slave from the good guy, oh, that's not the right word, but the victor, they would mark them, isn't it? Do you know that earrings originally were, in the ancient time, a mark of slavery? Isn't that fascinating? You get your ear pierced and you put a mark through there to say you were belonged to someone. Hmm? Yeah. And of course there were other forms of branding, marks, insignias was ty- were typed on people. Even Hitler had a band that he would put upon the Jews to mark them. And I'm touching on this because it's very easy for our natural mind to go into the sensual with this. I'm not saying that one day we couldn't have AI and, and it's saying, hey, take my microchip and plug yourself into me and, and, and you will know bliss. In that case, I'm saying, very literally, I wouldn't go there. I don't want any. I'm, not, I'm, I'm pro-human. This transhuman movement today, I'm not interested. You know, upgrade yourself with bioengineering and all that kind of stuff. Well, to me, it's a form of enslavement, isn't it? Put a little chip in there and we watch you everywhere you go. But my point is this. It's not what this passage is talking about, although it parallels. Yeah? Parallels. To be marked, to be marked with the mark of an animal, the nature of a beast, means that you never actually come into your your potential as, as, as God made you. If we go to Genesis, how many days was creation? Sorry? Come on, loud, nothing loud. Six. six days, isn't it? And yet it's a seven-day process, isn't it? Isn't it? Seven. Six days created, and then the seventh day, ah, rest. Say after me, Lord, we thank you for rest and peace. Amen. Because that's what you don't get when you're marked. Okay? Day one, chaos. Day two, you start having... Um, the water and the land separated and then you get vegetation and then you get animals then you get the moon and the sun and the stars these are all spiritual levels that we go through and our sixth stage that we go through we get to being made in the image and likeness of God day six is the number of man let's read it, let's have a read of the passage Uh, I think it's Start at verse 16. It says here, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Well, a hand is one's life, what you do. Forehead is your beliefs, your ideology, what you think. God has a mark too. 144,000, symbolic. And it means that it's in, the, it's in the forehead, and it means that your thoughts and your heart are being led by truth. So it's in the mark, it, it, so it's in the hand and the forehead, and verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save he that have the mark or the name of the beast and the number thereof. You know, Jesus said, buy the truth and sell it not. Yeah. But the, this, this mark is saying you cannot buy or sell without it. So it's like your thinking and your life are trapped. You're stuck in that economy, the economy of the brute, the unregenerate man, where you're stuck. And that is a place of endless combat. Believe me. Endless. And that's why, even though he goes on to say, we'll read a bit more, it says in verse 18, Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. It is the number of man which we just talked about being six, on day six, isn't it? 
the number of man. His number is 666. We call that recurring, don't we? Infinite recurring. When you do a calculation on a calculator and it comes up with an re infinite recurring. Six, 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 six. Recurring over and over and over again. The message is, you never, you're always, six is a number of combat, by the way. On day six is where you learn to finally defeat the lower self. And once you defeat the lower self, you get to move into peace and rest, day seven. But here, six, 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 recurring. So it's saying to us, this is staying in a permanently enslaved in a permanently unregenerate state. And that's why we need to become the warrior, the soul warrior. Because this happens to a lot of Christians. It happens to a lot of people who, who believe they're being spiritual. They're stuck in a kind of egocentric belief that they're better than everyone else. They're more righteous or whatever. Okay. So I hope you're getting a sense there of what this chapter is really saying to us. There's a lot more in there I could unpack, but we don't want to take all day. We've, you know, apparently pizzas are right too, so that's good. But I'd take a moment to say, because it's very colourful archetypes and very colourful stuff here, does anybody have any questions? about this that's come up for them. Happy to have questions. Bill couldn't make it today, but I thought, let's make a moment where people can throw in questions. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, no questions about this? Is it understanding the nature of the symbolism here? Six repeating over and over again, stuck in, in the unregenerate state, never able to come into the peace of God, 777? Seven, seven, seven. Yeah? Okay, so let's pray. Pray with me, just say, Lord, Lord. we are thankful that your word, it exposes things. It shows us things. But it doesn't leave us there, Lord. You're moving us on to New Jerusalem itself, where we can know peace and freedom from our selfish, egocentric way. We love you, Lord. And we thank you. Yeah. So, anyone wants notes, I'll send some. There were 10 pages of notes that I came up with. So I just gave you the very, very short version. Uh, I'm wondering if we could have, would, would, instead of just playing some music or even singing a new commandment today, would you like to play something for us today for a bit of time of meditation? And I'll close the word and sit down and, and, and meditate upon that too. And then we'll just say a benediction and we'll enjoy... Uh, a lovely pizza that's been, been brought for us. Actually, while she's getting ready, there is one more thing, and I've got to not forget to do this. It's your assignment for the month. Okay. Be sensitive to when you are craving attention from others. Talk to the Lord and ask for him to fill your pain, emptiness, and longing with his love. Remind yourself that goodness can only come from the Lord. Two. Notice any feelings of superiority. Pause and dwell upon a time where you failed at something. Yes, the pastor is saying, focus on something you failed at. Be thankful to the Lord for life experiences that help bring us back down to earth and help us to also be grounded. And number three, ask the Lord to keep us from grandiose thoughts on one extreme and also from wallowing in self-pity and self-loathing in the other. So there you go. I'll send that out via email. You borrow that. You go right ahead.
say a benediction. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance. And the Lord give you his everlasting Friends, let's have something to eat.